Welcome back to another episode of Podward State. I'm your host, Sam Brungo. It's just me for this little sports recap for the week. Stay tuned for Thursday's episode, another collaboration podcast with the Symbiotic Podcast with Cole Hans from the Huck Life Institute. We'll have uh, Matt Palizzi and Matt Ogden will be back on that one. So we'll have the full crew on this week. Joining us today, we have our sports editor, Will Pegler, talk about all things sports Penn State, including the resignation of head men's basketball coach Patrick Chambers earlier last week, and then reviewing Saturday's ugly loss to Indiana, and then previewing next week's big game against Ohio State. Pegs, how you doing? Sam, how's it going, man? Thank you for having me. All right, so... Let's just start off. We're going to chat a little bit about Pat Chambers. So what were your initial thoughts when you heard last Wednesday about the resignation of Pat Chambers? I was shocked. Man. It, uh, it came out of the blue. I think that's how a lot of people felt, you know. I mean, um, obviously, the stuff with Razier Bolton happened over the summer, that, that undefeated report. Um, and then after that, we kind of didn't, didn't hear much. A lot of the players defended him um, on Twitter and stuff. So I think myself and a lot of other people kind of assumed, like, all right, that's it. <clears throat> but turns out um, Sandy Barber explained it two weeks after the Razier Bolton report came out. Um, a full report was started. The NCAA went in and like investigated a lot of like Pat's behavior and they talked to a lot of different um, former players and other coaches. I guess there was enough, you know, bad stuff, negative stuff going on. That was enough to um, for the athletic department to ask him to resign. And news came out last week and, it was shocking, man. I, 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 was, I was pretty blindsided by it. Yeah, me too. Obviously, Pat Chambers has been here for almost a decade. Um, he's done a lot of good things for our program. Penn State has obviously always been a big football school, so it's a big job to come in and be a basketball coach in kind of a must-win um, environment here at Penn State. And he uh, started out rough, but really was coming around at the end of his uh, tenure here. So um, I just <laughs> – I was shocked too, but I think that it really does have nothing to do with his performance on the court and everything to do with just uh, some negative things that came out about him and what he said and just some bad shit. I don't know. I Yeah, I mean, like like you said, uh, Sandy Barber did a press conference. Like, you know, we got like – like it was like 10 minutes – not 10 minutes, but it was like half an hour after the news came out, Sandy Barber hopped on a press conference over Zoom um, that was like – I think BTN picked it up, so it was, like, nationally televised. But she never – she didn't really go into, like, any details. A lot of people tried to. There's been a lot of different reports from different outlets about, like, specifics, but they haven't they haven't shared any any specifics, which is a little weird. But, I mean, I guess it makes sense. They, they can't really share that kind of information. But we don't really know much right now, so it's, it's pretty strange. Do you think that some of that information will uh, break the Internet and uh... – come out and we'll hear some more about what happened at some point in the near future. I think the hard thing might be there like might be, you know, different reports that come out, but <clears throat> a lot of what I've seen has been like anonymous sources or just like unnamed former assistant coaches. So it's hard to like kind of confirm that stuff. Um, unless Penn state comes out and says what, it, what happens, which I doubt they'll do really specifically. We might not hear a lot of confirmed specifics, but yeah, I think there's definitely going to be a lot of reports throughout the season, especially as the back basketball season picks back up. Um, November 25th, I think, is the date that the season is allowed to start. So late November, when things get going again, we might hear we might hear more. So what do you think is next for Pat Chambers? Um, hard to predict right now. I mean, it seems with what what it, what his statement was, he's going to take a step back from from coaching in, in the next few years. Maybe he could become like you know a, a help train guys. I mean, the guy clearly knows basketball, so I'm assuming he's going to stay like within the world of basketball. <clears throat> maybe work one-on-one -on -one with players and help them get ready for the draft, that kind of thing. Um, but that's obviously just speculation. I'm, I'm not, not a hundred percent sure, but from what it seems like he, he's going to be out of the, out of the coaching game for the foreseeable, foreseeable future. It seems. Pat did a lot of great things for this, uh, for not only the basketball program, but also the state college community. And it just is a shame that that all kind of has this negative light on it because of the way that it ended. Right. And then what do we think is next for Penn State basketball? Obviously, they hired inside and uh, brought in a new head coach. So what can you tell us a little bit about him and about what we can expect, not only this year, but in the coming few years for Penn State basketball? Yeah, sure. So um, Jim Ferry, he's he was the offensive coordinator. He's one of the assistant coaches for three, three seasons. 
And looking at the stats, I mean, the offense was awesome um, when he when he was there. His second year there, obviously, was that NIT run. I'm sorry, his first year there was that NIT run. Um, second year there, 2018-19 uh, season wasn't so great. But then, obviously, last year, Penn State was a surefire NCAA tournament team. I think they put up the – they averaged, like, the third most points in the Big Ten. So, the offense looked great under, under his uh, – assistant coaching position. Um, so that's good news for the Nittany Lions. But even with um, with Pat here, I think a lot of people knew there were still a lot of holes to fill on this team. I mean, Lamar Stevens gone, hurts. Mike Watkins gone, hurts. Um, and they still got guys like Jamari Wheeler, John Harrow with a lot of experience. But a lot of young, really young players were going to be needed or are going to be needed to step up. Um, so with or without Pat Chambers, I think uh, Penn State Hoops wasn't was looking at probably not as strong of a year as, as last year, in my opinion, just because of the amount of talent they've lost. But Jim Perry's got a lot of experience in basketball. He's been around and he's been a head coach for like 30 years before he even got to Penn State. Um, so he's got a lot of experience and, and maybe he could, you know, turn this team around and make another like Cinderella season, Cinderella run um, in 2020, 2021. But um, we'll, we'll find out. Um, some more Big news came out last week regarding Penn State sports. We saw Journey Brown will be out likely for the season with a undisclosed medical condition. So what can you tell us about that? Yeah, sure. So another thing we don't know a ton about uh, besides the fact that they found this medical condition and it, it revealed itself like during the off season um, and he's being, he's being treated for it. But as of now, we can't play on it. Um, we don't really know what it is. There was, you know, speculation about, about what it could be, but that's not, that's not confirmed at all. Um, obviously he didn't play. He wasn't on the depth chart against Indiana. Um, Penn state's gonna have another depth chart come out early this week, or it will be out um, by the time this is, this is released. So we'll find out if he's playing against Ohio state or not. I'd be, I'd be shocked if he is um, just considering the fact that even if he were healthy enough to play, he's our, he's, it'd be such a, you know, fast turnaround to have to get back into practice shape and, and get ready for a game against, the third team, number three team in the country, that'd be, that'd be pretty tough to do. So um, not a lot is known right now, but it's Penn State's uh, athletic statement on it did say he could potentially miss the whole season. So as of now, that's, that's what we're looking at. Um, it's, it's kind of um, if he will play, not when. So, um, but we hopefully we'll find out more as, as the season goes on. So if potentially he is out for the season, but is able to come back at some point, might we have seen our last Journey Brown in Happy Valley in a Penn State uniform? If he if he is able to get back and, and play, I mean, he was already – there was already talk – there was already draft talks surrounding him before this season even started. Um, so I could definitely see that. I mean, as, as long as this injury doesn't – you know, God forbid it, it affects his, his – uh, the rest of his football career. Um, but if, if he's able to come back and, and play the second half of the season or, or something like that and he – he, you know, plays up to his expectations, then, yeah, no, I wouldn't be surprised if, if he enters the NFL draft and, and goes ahead and is a high-round pick, you know? I mean, he's, he's a really good running back. There's no arguing that. The way he finished last season was nuts. I mean, he put up uh, more than 200 rushing yards in the Cotton Bowl. Um, I think he had more than 100 rushing yards in all of Penn State, four of Penn State's last five games. So, I mean, the dude finished the season on a tear, and um, – he's worked hard to get to this point. So that's part of the reason it really just stinks to see a guy like that um, have to go down. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's really tough to see, but we wish the best for him, no doubt. What are your initial reactions to the Indiana loss and a uh, little summary of that game? Yeah. I mean, that game sucked. <laughs> There's like no doubt about it. I mean, the first word that comes to mind for me is just frustrating. I mean, Penn state won, in every stat besides James Franklin said it, turnovers and penalties. I mean, the Nittany Lions like consistently just shot themselves in the foot. Um, it looked like things were going to go well after after that first drive. They it was like a 13 play, 64 yard drive, finished it off with a touchdown to Pat Fryer move. It's like all right, great, here we go. This offense is rolling again. Um, but then, but then after that, in the first half, they either punted, they punted twice, missed the field goal, and turned the ball over three times. So a lot of people were obviously complaining about the way it ended with that, with that call by the refs um, or the, the review on whether or not Penix got in. But, but the, the Penn State, you know, without those first half mistakes, they really shouldn't or wouldn't have even been in that position. Um, so I would say just a really frustrating performance overall, especially now that they're 0-1 and have to look now to 
a game against the third best team in the country in Ohio State. Obviously, a theme of uh, post-game interviews and reviews of the game where we have to focus on what we do in the first um, 60 minutes rather than what we do at the end of the game. So, obviously, that was a theme. But what is your opinion of what happened on that two-point conversion at the end of the game, Will? Do I think he got in or not? I do not think he got in. I think um, the problem is the call on the field was that he got in. I think if the call on the field were he was short, they would have reviewed it and said he was short. But it was so close, um, I think it's just hard to make that – to overturn that call. I mean, it, it's all it's, – it has to be, I think, the, the fine print. It has to be um, indisputable evidence. Sorry. Um, was there indisputable evidence? I thought so. I thought that angle – because the, the tweet – the picture that kind of went viral was like the side angle. But then um, whoever's broadcasting the game, Fox, had a replay of like a, a front angle. And in my opinion, you can see the ball – hit out of bounds before it hit the front left pylon. Um, but that's neither here nor there. They lost. It is what it is now. But, um, yeah, I think if the call on the field were that he were short before they reviewed it, then they would have reviewed it and said said he was short. I don't, I don't think they were changing that call, unfortunately, for Penn State. What are some things you saw during the game on Saturday that you liked, and what are some things that you saw that you didn't like? Just some initial reactions. Yeah, sure. I mean, so even though, obviously, Penn State lost the game, and that's a problem, they're on one or – and then the Lions are on one. But there were some things that were good. I mean, the defense played well up until um, that final drive by Penix. Indiana was held to 211 total yards. Um, Shaka Tony had two huge sacks. Joey Porter stepped up and made plays. Plays Lamont Wade, since the end of last year, I mean, it seems like that guy is always stepping up and making, and making big plays. He had that big interception. So what the defense did, they were uh, – the defense was consistent, in my opinion, in getting stops. They really – they didn't, and especially in the first half, obviously, they got no help from Penn State's offense. At one point, uh, thanks to one of Clifford's interceptions in the first half, Indiana got the ball and like Penn State's four. I mean, what do you want? What do you want the defense to do? You know what I mean? So defense overall, I like that. I think they played well. They they can build on that performance definitely, especially with a lot of veterans. Um, Sean Clifford's second half was good. Uh, obviously, the first half <laughs> not good. Two picks um, and a lot of shaky play, but. James Franklin mentioned it after the game. He really kind of got more confident as a runner, which was pretty fun to watch. I mean, he had that one of those touchdown runs. He was 35 yards. He, he juked out a few guys and, and got his way to the end zone. That was awesome to watch. He, he was Penn State's leading rusher. So if he can keep doing that, I mean, that, that can develop into a big part of Penn State's offense. I think he had 114 yards on the day. And second half play overall, obviously that was a good thing. If, if Penn State can t- take what it did in the second half, not the first half, um, against Ohio State, a much better Ohio State team compared to Indiana, then that's a good thing because Penn State is going to need to play pretty much a perfect game. Um, in terms of the bad, turnovers and penalties, brutal. You, I, they had 10 penalties worth 100 yards against them. Obviously, three turnovers in the first half. One of them was that Will Levis fumble where they were Penn State was on Indiana's nine, I believe, and, and he had it stripped, and they, they left points on the board there. Um, the – well, there's three total missed field goals. One of them was obviously Stout's 57 yarders. So tough, tough to ask for a make there, but missed field goals too. I mean, turnovers and missed field goals were two things that they they totally left points on the board there. And you really can't do that against even against in the end. I mean, that's a good Big Ten opponent. So that was the biggest thing. Um, slow start, obviously, a bad first half on offense. Um, and then also special teams, really, which is brutal. Um, they got bailed out at one point. Jahan Dotson and Marquise Wilson kind of had that miscommunication because Jahan dropped the punt, punt return. He muffed it, um, and Indiana recovered it. But the guy who recovered it on Indiana actually stepped out of bounds. So Penn State got bailed out there. There was a few plays like that where they really just gave up yards on special teams. There's nothing really spectacular on special teams, in my opinion. So that's an area Penn State's going to need to clean up in, in less than a week now when Ohio State comes to town. An MVP, offensive, defensive, special teams. Who would you choose? Yeah, offensive, I'd go Pat Um Clifford targeted him like 10 times. He led the way with seven catches. He had a sick one-handed grab also, which was exciting. Um, he played well. I think if, if, not, if not Pat Fryermuth, probably Jahan Dotson. He had that huge um, 60-yard catch that gave Penn State the lead late. I think those two guys would be my MVPs. They, they stepped up and made plays when Penn State really needed them. And, and when they after they dug themselves in, into a hole, I think two of those guys really – stepped up and helped out. Obviously, Pat had the first touchdown in the game. And, and with, with that, he um, broke Mike Kosicki's record for most touchdowns by a tight end at Penn State, which is huge. So I, for offensive, I'd, I'd either have Pat or Jahan Dotson. 
Um, defensive, I'd go Shaka Pony. He had seven tackles, led the way with that, um, led the way with two sacks, and they were back to back, which were huge. I mean, he put he sacked Penix twice in a row, and forced Indiana into like a third and twenty-two, which they didn't convert. And if Devin Ford, if Penn State doesn't score and kneels it out, then that those two plays are um, really the game sealers by Shaka. So on defense, he stepped up in a huge way. Um, Special teams, like I said, there wasn't a lot of good on special teams, really. Um, Jordan Stout punted the ball well, though. He didn't really have any big mistakes. He put Indiana inside their own 20 twice. Flipping the field, that's important. I'd, I'd go with Stout for MVP on special teams. Um, and then, oh, and one more. A guy who stepped up and was kind of a surprise. I think this is no no shocker here, Joey Porter Jr. He balled out. He had, he had that first sack um, on Indiana's first possession. He really played well. I mean, I think a lot of people were surprised um, – that he was starting over Keaton Ellis uh, earlier last week, but he proved himself, man. After redshirting this year, after what Franklin said, he was frustrated after redshirting. He really stepped up against Indiana and, and made a lot of big plays on defense. Saturday was our first look at uh, offensive coordinator Kirk Caraca. Like we've been saying, the offense just didn't really look like it was going. So what do you think that he's got to do moving forward just to, to change that? And what do we think – is the outlook for Penn State's offense this year with his new coordinator that so far in the first game against not a great opponent just looked flat and not very good? You know, I, I mean, I think it's, it's hard to put it all on him just because I think some of it could have been first game hitters for a lot of young guys. Um, Clifford also looked pretty shaky. I mean, it's hard to blame him for, for the two picks. But, no, no doubt, um, I think a lot of people thought the play calling was questionable early. A lot of those inside handoffs that just consistently got stuffed. There was a few plays that were – Super frustrating, especially when you consider the kind of weapons Penn State has on the outside. Um, there was one fourth and one where they went up the middle on a simple carry, and they didn't even they didn't pick up any yards. So things like that were were frustrating. I think a lot of people, um, instead of those inside carries, are really going to look, especially against Ohio State, is just getting into the playmakers. Um, and it sounds simple, but Pat Fryermuth, Jahan Dotson, we already mentioned them. If Noah Kane's back, uh, he he went down on that first drive, but if he's back. I would feed him the ball against Ohio State, man. I mean, he, he proved himself last year as a beast. But like you said, I mean, Indiana's not a bad team, but Ohio State is much better than Indiana. And we'll talk about them in a sec. But their defense is absurd. So um, you're, you're really going to need to improve in, like I said, less than a week against the number three team in the, number three team in the country. So um, we'll see if they can on offense. Um, I think more aggressive play calling is, is, is really the biggest – biggest complaint um, for a lot of people right now last Saturday obviously we saw that loss to Indiana uh, dropping Penn State 10 spots back to 18 landing Indiana one spot above at 17 uh, this Saturday Ohio State comes into Beaver Stadium to play in an empty empty whiteout um, what changes can we expect from Penn State coming into this game on defense not much I think you just got to hope a lot of those guys can do it again step up and make plays against an even better team um, but on offense, you got to hope Noah King is healthy and you can have him. Um, he's a guy that really, I think, was expected to help make this offense go, especially without Journey Brown. Um, just a guy that you could give the ball. And he really just eats yards. Just pick up five yards when you can. Um, get in a second man, second and manageable, things like that. Um, so that's going to be big. Obviously, that's still up in the air whether or not he's playing right now. Um, but if he's healthy, you, you really got to hope for that. Um, and – Better decision-making in general for the offense. Uh, you can't turn the ball over three times against Ohio State. You can't do it against Indiana either. You definitely can't do it against Ohio State. Um, you just you, you can't leave points on the board like that. Um, so I would say just more people are going to look for a more kind of steady, calm Sean Clifford, which I, I believe he can do. He, I mean, he's got a year of experience under his belt. He played well last year in his first year starting. Um, so if he can find that, find that balance once again of, of kind of calm, cool, and collected in the pocket, that's going to be big for Penn State, and and like I said, they're gonna they're gonna to need to play a perfect game um, against Ohio State, who's arguably the best team in college football, um, along with Clemson, probably right now. All right, this weekend, Penn State has a chance to turn it around after Week One against Ohio State here in Beaver Stadium at 7:30 on ABC. Pegs, appreciate you coming on. We can catch uh, Pegs on Spotify at Pegs and Plates for more sports coverage and obviously some sports analysis for the football game later in the week. Will, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks very much, Dan. Thanks for having me, dude. All right. That was another episode of 
Podward State with our special guest, Will Pegler, our sports editor. Uh, stay tuned for some, uh, some, some more science talk on Thursday with uh, the Symbiotic Podcast, hosted by Cole Hans uh, from the Huck Institute. Uh, that'll be coming out on Thursday with Matt and Matt. Thanks again for listening and uh, cheers.